Hi, I'm Julia. I work at the Library of Congress. And this morning, we're going to have a little bit of a show and tell. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so while well, resources like QC tools and the Artifact Atlas have gone a very long way for creating a shared and growing knowledge base, how can we help non-specialized staff or staff with only intermittent work with these types of workflows? And I count myself as one of those types of people. Um, and what have born digital workflows or workflows with unclear chains of custody? What is an artifact and what is business as usual? Um, with digital files, conversations invariably focus on levels of fixity at the frame and file level, but what are some of the less obvious areas that we can try to look for and understand collectively today? And how can we, how can we have our colleagues, and how have some of our colleagues worked through some of these obvious areas? Today, for the first part of the session, we'll look through some errors in a show and tell that's open to audience participation. Um, so some of these files are not very pleasant to listen to or watch. Uh, we'll just see how it goes. First, this is the audio. If you have sensitivity to audio, you might not want to. Oh, it's not mirrored. It's OK. This one's mostly audio, but for the latter ones. Yeah. You should, you should put the screen into the other screen. OK. Wait just one second. It, like here. OK. Um, can we get the audio on it? Let's see. One sec, sorry. We'll move on to the next one. That's the only one with audio. Uh, but in any case, what you can see on this next screen are some of the visual errors. Uh, so in this case, this was a collection of born digital a quick time per res 422 HQ files where the checksums matched, and yet later, through various batch ingest and transcoding processes, major errors like the ones that we can see right here uh, occurred. And to give a bit more background, these files were created on the go throughout the country over a long period of time, so many hard drives, many people, um, before eventually getting distributed to their two archival repositories, the Library of Congress and Smithsonian Namak, and I think one of the other archivists is here today. In extreme cases, approximately four of the files didn't even play. Essential header metadata was missing, according to prompts that we heard about yesterday in Ashley's presentation that the move atom was not found. In other cases, errors were fleeting and virtually undetectable to the naked eye. Some of these errors can be seen easily in the file is truncated metadata and the lack of general technical metadata as seen in the top left. While this case has been, in some ways, great for advocating for earlier checksum creation towards the time of file creation, this is still largely unachie unachievable to most standard archival donors. And even with savvy and willing donor adoption, none of them, at least with me, have been able to create and maintain a change log to document purposeful modifications made to files before or after updating checksums leaving us with potentially many other assets with verified files, but flaws like the one seen today. Blake, one of my project partners, has been attending. I don't know if he might have stepped out of the room. And if he, wanted, if he is here, if he wanted to add anything to this use case. Um, but maybe to start off some discussion on this particular one before we move on, I'm curious, given the way uh, the move Adam uh, not found issue is probably very prevalent given the way it's written. Um, and uh, it's a common error. If other people have had experience with it and have been able to actually fix the move atom or recover those files, in our case, we were only able to recover those simply because we had extra copies of those files. So there's nothing we could do in that case. And um, Perhaps do people generally, as a matter of course, rewrite any of these types of files to move that to the beginning with, um, I believe there's like a fast start flag. Anybody? In the back. Uh, Kalogin Hoyos from FFmpeg. Um, 
In general, you cannot uh, read a MOF or MP3 file if this atom is missing. Yeah? However, the question is always why it is missing. If the file was actually written on the camera, then this atom is written continu rewritten continuously. Yeah? So there is a chance that a, that a, a copy of, an, of a former atom is, a, is available within the file, yeah? and you can point the start of the file to that atom, at least theoretically. Yeah? I've seen such cases. So in the general case, where for like a tool like FFmpeg transcodes a file, and somehow is forced to quit before the very end and cannot write the atom simply because the process is, is, can, is, is terminated by the operating system, then in, in general there's no way to recover the file. If the, recover, if the file is video only or audio only, you, do, you generally don't have a problem because then you only have one stream and that you can recover from the file. You don't need the atom. But if they are audio and video interleaved, you would have to go basically manually through the file to find out what is audio and what is video. This is a very, very time-consuming effort, and uh, it is not guaranteed to succeed in the general case. But you're saying if it was a camera raw file that you'd have a higher chance of success because it's continuously being written? If, if, it's, if the camera itself writes a QuickTime file, then as far as yes. I remember, it typically, it does not wait until the end to write this atom once, but it writes it continuously while writing video and audio data. So there are different copies of the atom in, within the file, uh, and if there's only a problem when writing the last one, then you may have a chance to recover an earlier one to be able to read at least uh, most of the file. I'm not saying this always works, but there's at least a theoretical chance. Theoretical. Uh, an indication that this is the case is that you find free atoms within the file. Usually it would make no sense for the camera to write free atoms. These are atoms that are just uh, jumped over when reading the file. So if the file contains free atoms, several of them, then there's a good chance that the last of them is a move atom that you can use. But this is just a, like a, I, I've seen such files, so it can happen. Um, I'm sure this is very prevalent, so I'm curious if other people have had experience with trying to struggle with this before we move on to the next use case of the move atoms not found, at least, or... Hi, uh, my name's Gareth Harbord. I work for the Met Police doing video forensics. Um, I've had to repair a few files uh, like this in the past. I've done it manually. It's a nightmare, but you can do it. The, the starting point you need is a working file produced by the same system, ideally at the same yeah. time with similar encoding characteristics. And there is some software on the market that does it now. It's paid for software. I think one of them might be called Stellar Video, and there's there is another one, and basically if you take the donor file, it would do its best to remap it. it. It's not an easy process, but it can be done. Cool, thank you. Um, unless somebody else has something to add, I think we can move on to our next questionable file. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's number two. This one, right? Yeah, the way it should be. So we have audio and we need to adjust it somehow or get out some audio from the laptop. Sorry for it. It's noise. I'll just fill it in. It's weird noise. <laughs> 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 Most of the following errors are more visual, or at least more compelling as a visual, so we can move on. Um, if I could get, okay. So that captures a moment of transition that we saw in the video, but what happens in this particular subset of files is the expected duration of this, this comes from a broadcast, uh, this comes from WGBH Boston, a broadcast um, 
organization. The duration is correct, but what will happen is it'll go through that spinning motion where it starts splitting apart and then stay on a static image like the one on the right for the rest of the expected 40 minutes or whatever the broadcast capture was meant to be. So it is reading something from metadata, headed metadata, I suppose, about the expected duration and size. And in their case, uh, it actually went through all the automated QCs. And it was only through manual QC later on that a staff member noticed this happening, um, which prompted them to then create a new QC method where they would create thumbnails throughout through hundreds of files to see if at some point in the thumbnails you got that static image for the rest of it. Um, so to give a, a bit more context, it's born digital, broadcast. There were no checksums created because there was a high pressure, high production sort of environment. And the files were simply co copied back and forth to different um, storage servers um, through vendors. Um, so it was not what a, a one-off. Um, and this is part of a whole batch of other errors that they were discovered. And this is courtesy of Rebecca Framo. Um, I should mention that she's happy to also take comments and questions via email or Twitter. Um, I'm sure she's sleeping right now. But um, again, I guess I would throw it out to the crowd. Has anyone experienced this? Has anybody maybe you know, have a sense of why that type of error would happen, um, given the clues I suppose I've given you? Um, how often does this type of filling in happen? And Carl. <laughs> I grabbed the mic first. Um, I'll run it back, though. Um, I was wondering, what was I going to ask? Uh, did you try in different playback methods, like using VLC, using FFplay, et cetera, to find if that is consistent throughout I'm the different? I'm sure, yeah, because it was hundreds of hundreds of files that were found this way. Yeah. Can you read what the codec is because I cannot? And they weren't transcoding. They were simply copying things back and forth. So there, there shouldn't have been so, manipulation. Go ahead, yeah. So first to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. First to your answer, it, if you use VLC and FFplay to check, if, to, to, to like double check a playback, the problem is that in both cases you will use the same library. So you will not, ease, you will in some cases at least uh, not get a, a, a solution. Can somebody tell me what the codec is here? Because I cannot read it sadly. 2VUI. Okay, so, sorry, in this case, I just want to mention that there are cases for compressed video that where the decoder is so, like, uh, surprised about the data that he just stops decoding. Uh, this is apparently not the case here, but uh, it can be. If this is V21, V210? So if it's uncompressed raw video, then the data on the hard drive itself is damaged because there is no other explanation for this uh, behavior in that case. And then it's not really multimedia, but more like uh, hard drive related. It's a hard drive. You think it's hard drive related. Oh, another comment. So actually, um, in VL in VLC, we actually have our own MP4, so QuickTime demuxer, which is completely separate code from uh, libav format in, from FFmpeg. So actually, between VLC and FFplay, you might have different uh, behavior. Uh, the real story, we have our own demuxers because we needed HLS, Dash, and et cetera, better support before it was in FFmpeg, and we keep maintaining it and adding more stuff. Uh, so actually, depending on how you play it, you might be able to have different behavior between mm. the two. I don't know which one of the demuxer would be more uh, resilient to errors in the file, but it's possible they behave differently and you might be able to recover with one an another. Uh, so if, you c if it works in VLC, for example, 
VLC has a transcoder on transmoxer, so if it works there, it's possible to use the demoxer from VLC to transcode the file into another file, and then it will be a correct file that you can use anywhere. So, uh, but I'll recommend I to make sure that she tests. But yes, so I kind I of imagine that she did test that at some point. I'm hoping. Yeah, I suppose you probably used VLC, so that means in that case the demoxer from VLC doesn't work. In VLC, it's also possible to force the use of the libav format demoxer instead of the VLC one. So you have both options to test with the two demoxers, and hopefully one of them is able to read the file. Thank you. There's a comment in the back. Hi. Um, well, I'd be curious, um, was it looked at in a hex editor at all? Because I guess if it was a, uh, no, oh, sorry. Oh, just if it was um, such a static born digital image, I wonder. Um, Whether you can see the same, yeah. like, repeat, repeat, repeat. Exactly, and it would save uh, doing much investigation in different tools and demoxers, like it's just, it's the data is fundamentally yeah. broken and repetitive. I don't have access to all these full files necessarily, but I think for a number of these, that is a logical next step. I so I would be curious as well. That's what I was going to say as well. I've gotten a lot of value of, of opening it up in a hex editor and finding um, working with something similar to this, I had a similar uh, thing that would freeze, it would play for a little bit and then freeze on one frame for the duration. But I, I keep in mind that the duration is, is basically the metadata that's like at the header, so it knows how long it's supposed to be. And then it's just sort of filling in my understanding uh, what the rest of the stuff should be. And it's no longer playing. But when I open it up in hex editor, the data is not there. It's, it was 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, yeah. which was interesting. We can move along. Oh, we've got a couple more, four, five more. Well, we had one right. Oh, I yeah. No, go, please. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, they're really born digital ma material? Yep. Because Production it kind of board. reminds me of what I've experienced from mini DV uh, when capturing. They're kind of freeze frames in between. It's just, a, it reminded me of that. And Let's I wanted see. to ask if maybe they were originally mini DV or DV. I know this is a relatively recent find. Uh, Rebecca actually gave a much fuller presentation at Code for Lib a few years ago. So, and she reassured me that they were born digital, but I don't know about the carriers. Um, I can ask her about that. And maybe you guys can compare notes, perhaps. Uh, Dave Rice, I wanted to uh, recommend, there's a, a field in media info often that says if a file is, is truncated or not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it likely could that. be that the, the, the move header is at the beginning of the, of the file and lists the duration, but then the file is truncated, so uh, it's trying to present the intended duration but doesn't have enough content to fill it, so, so stalls out. Um, so the file might be shorter, like as if the transfer was interrupted. Um, <clears throat> or, or as Ashley was saying, you know, perhaps in the transfer, it's, it's zero padded at the end because of a migration error. Cool. We'll definitely look at that. Um, the last case actually had some of that is truncated in the technical metadata, but did not display that type of behavior. It was a different, I guess, visual error of some kind, like more of the traditional glitch, I guess. Or, um, so let's move to the next use case, number three. Um, Oh, great. We can just play it as is. It's good, but thank you. Can you see? Oh, sorry. Well, I think you were able to see that horizontal artifact, hopefully. OK. So I think that was more, one of the more aesthetically pleasing ones that we'll see. Um, this is from a one-inch transfer, and it's potentially related to a break in, I don't know, I'm speculating, calculated relationships between screen aspect ratio, display aspect ratio, and pixel aspect ratio. Uh, the display aspect ratio is 4 or 3 as expected. The SAR is 1 1, which would mean, as expected, that the pixel aspect ratio should be non-square for this expected PAL tape, but then there are also noted um, technical characteristics that point to PAL standards in, sorry, you probably can't see very well, in the bottom 
so all the standard 725, 76, 25. But if you also look, it says standards NTSC, so they're conflicting, seemingly confl conflicting technical characteristics. Um, and it also, in one of the outputs, says the pixel aspect ratio is 1.0, which is weird. So uh, I have questions about where Media Info, for example, pulls the pixel aspect ratio. Um, reading online, it seems like it's interpreted from those very technical, other technical char characteristics to infer that. Um, so this could mean that the file itself is wrong, or is it a type of wrong? Can we talk more in depth about the wrong? Or uh, perhaps someone here could help us. <laughs> So uh, this kind of questions, uh, uh, how useful is my my answer actually? <laughs> well, it's, it's it's useful. I mean, I wanted to make sure to hunt down what you would say, but if it's inferring it from the other characteristics, shouldn't it say pal? <laughs> so, but also then we did see that visual error, the horizontal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I defer would, it to be, you. <laughs> would it be useful to know the source of the metadata, yes. for example? Yes. So, uh, it is a bit longer to code, but it is possible. Yeah. Um, it is some stuff to code, so it is not doable in one day, but it is something possible to say where I picked such kind of information, for example. Anyone else want to talk about PAL and NTSC? <laughs> Um, can you just go back to the, the media info output? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Um, so just just the question about the, the square pixel. I mean, I, I see that quite a lot with some capture tools. Like, I think Final Cut uh, Pro 7 wouldn't insert any um, pixel aspect ratio metadata. So you'd get 720 by 576 with square pixels, and it wouldn't be 4 by 3, it'd be 5 by 4. And, so, I mean, I don't... Um, but that's like a not related to what we saw potentially? No, I, I, I don't think it is. Okay. I think that, that, that's very common. If you put it, um, if you put it um, the files into a timeline and export it, Apple would write the correct metadata. But yeah, I've seen a huge amount of files like this. Um, they can even come from vendors and stuff. And we usually just correct it when we're transcoding or something. Um, but as for yeah, where it's getting the NTSC, or like the... F yeah, there's a, lot, a few puzzling. Like, is that down here? It's a separate. Uh, I'm just trying to make oh, yeah. it visually. <laughs> OK. Well, no, anyway, I just wanted to make a point about the, the square pixels. And yes. That it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Has anybody else seen that um, artifact? Can you play it again? Sure. If I can find it. Oh, where is it? Sort of like a wrinkle that moves up and down. Um, <clears throat> why do you think there is an issue? I mean, yeah, of course there's an issue, but <laughs> I have a suspicion, and I may be wrong, that, that this is how the file is actually encoded. I mean, that's part of the question. Is this business as usual? Um, some would say that this is a, an error of some kind. So. Because so because I think it's a it's a rel it's a it's an unknown visual error or okay. or business as usual. So I don't know. it's a two six four video. Did I see that correctly? Or, or because it says AVC on on the on the media info uh, panel. Is that correct? Sorry. Wait. Yeah. So if there would be a problem in the two six four file in the video stream yeah, that would would lead to such artifacts. Yeah, then your screen would be full of, of, of horrible error messages. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the indication that you did not say there are error messages is most likely that this is how the file was encoded, whatever did this. And this leads me to another point that 
<clears throat> I, I, I really want to make, yeah? because I re regularly get user requests and bug reports and I work on them. Yeah? Nobody here disagrees that there is an issue in the file because it says NTSC, although it has 25 frames, which simply isn't possible. Yeah? Mm. But this is not necessarily the reason for the visual issue you see. I mean, it could be part of the capture. I mean, there are layers here with this one since it's coming from... That's possible. Yeah, so... There are a bunch of other comments, so hold on. Um, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Alex from the BFI. Now, to me, that looks like a, an analog art artifact. It looks like there's a problem with the TBC in the one-inch machine. Hmm. I've seen it before, oh. having had a lot of experience with two-inch and one-inch. And it looks like that's how it was ingested. And I think that's why you're getting all these funny, because you can't have PAL and NTSC together. It's just impossible, yes. right? OK. So because I think, because of the problems with the time-based corrector attached to the one-inch machine, you're getting all this crap mm. coming up. Th that could be, yeah. So perhaps in this case, they have to go back and try to redo it if possible. Yes. Hi, I'm Peter. I w like, it would be interesting if it was on the analog side, but I'm just guessing if it would happen on the digital side before actual encoding, mm. like you get in the uncompressed raw signal, and then like two or three pixels in a line are dropped, then the whole thing shifts for certain lines, uh -huh. and then it fills it up again. So you've got these, and if this occurs yeah. in a regularly unregular interval, you might have this moving up and down, because it seems like it starts in the middle of a line, draw several lines with an offset. Now imagine you lose like three pixels, you get this odd thing. I'm, that I'm just making this up from yeah, what it no. could be yeah, when it comes in. Um. So I want to thank Anonymous who contributed this file. And um, this archivist speculates that actually it was an in-between process um, at some point where the files were transferred and then there was some intervening hardware or software that had presets potentially that then created the two standards somehow or something, some intervening process after the transfer in between. Anyway, but, um, Ashley? I, I want to sort of emphasize what Jerome said. I feel like I came and asked him, um, are you being a little polite? Is it true that people could pay to fix this problem, or to get more analysis work done on this prod button? That's very true. So I think that for the people that you're speaking on behalf of that come from really well-funded institutions, they should consider doing that. Agree. Yeah, the media info part of the problem. Yeah. No, no, I definitely wasn't saying that. No, I was just trying to, you know, understand. Um, I think we can move on to the next one, unless somebody else has something to say. Sorry. All right. All right, here we go. Yeah, this is this is going through a filter. It's the bit plane filter and shoot <laughs> in QC tools. And if you could see before, and I'll pull it up again, uh, the bits decrease in difference as you move from the left to the right. If you're un unfamiliar with that tool, um, this file comes courtesy of El Eddie Colleton. Again, he's very interested to hear any feedback. And I think this use case actually involves a couple of different things that are kind of interesting, at least to me, to think about and speculate on. Um, if we, so you can see a lot of difference, but in, if we go back to the slide, <laughs> uh, I wonder, for those that are unfamiliar with uh, QC tools or, or this filter in FFmpeg, if you could sort of explain what's uh, happening here visually. Sure. Um, so it's actually playing back in real time the video, and so I have a screenshot in this slideshow where you can see how it's representing the visual imagery, but as it moves from left to right in the slicing of the bits, the differentiation um, 
uh, decreases. Like, so as you get toward the top high level bits, potentially there's no difference, um, which we'll see in the next slide. So this is the one that sort of initially spurred my curiosity. Um, so to give a bit more background, this comes from an HDCAM vendor transfer. Um, it went through, um, I, f I forget the deck model, but there are a number of decks that handle both uh, digital and analog inputs and put out, uh, taken both 8-bit and 10-bit sort of information and put out through an SDI. Um, 10 bits, but in this case, um, and he was also speculating, so he'd be happy to hear your feedback. Uh, you can't really tell the difference, right? The, the, the filtering makes it virtually indistinguishable. So this is another case where looking at the hex might make it more clear if there's a high level of information captured um, or if it's the same at that point. Um, here's uh, two different moving images where you can actually see more differentiation. Um, these are with different decks, again, with HDCAM, so 8-bit, with the bit plane filter for 10-bit. Um, so you can sort of get a sense of, if you're unfamiliar with this tool, how it slices it up visually. Um, so, Perhaps it's a benign problem or really not a problem at all, but I think it's interesting to think about upsampling. Uh, does that, is that really only just a sense that an issue in terms of space? Um, uh, how much do DAC specifications matter? In his case, part of his questions were how much to go back to the vendor and question uh, the specifics of the transfer and to sort of interrogate what was happening there. Um, and then some more tweets. Uh, so that's Eddie on top, if you haven't met him. There's been some discussion, and I missed EMEA, but I know this came up at the last EMEA, about deck variation um, in terms of like the quality of capture and outputs. Um, so again, it's important to note that all these pass automated QC, so it's more just like on Eddie, at, Eddie and I are like, should, should we care on some level, or how much does it matter, and how, how can you have these conversations, I suppose? Um, and this is another tweet I dug up from 2016, where uh, they are talking about various deck captures, various deck um, quality differences, and Kieran notes that he sees a difference in the V channel, potentially, uh, when using Let's see, beta SP in a digi beta deck. And I, I don't know, I don't want to just spit out model names because I just want to think through the concepts here. So perhaps, I don't know if people want to discuss some of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I can't really remember the V thing, but I, I do remember, I think there was extra noise when extracting, or looking at the extract planes filter, when you were just, it, it was, um, I think in the Y channel, when I was comparing um, DigiBeta decks versus beta SP decks, um, it was just more noticeable. But if you, if you go back to the, um, the, the, the bit plane Im images, yeah. So like, I actually think that probably looks fine. Like it, that doesn't seem to have the issue. And then in the next ones, just, um, yeah, like the, definitely. These are the other HD cam vendors. Yeah, like in the in the top two image, like generally you just see that um, continued degradation in bits nine and ten, but you see that, you know, that sudden. They're not quite identical, but you know, there, there's there's a shift in nine and yeah. ten, and that that generally seems to happen. With, um, and it's also very helpful to look okay. at the vector scopes and waveforms yeah. in um, QC tools as well, or in FFmpeg which are, you know, um, you see a lot of, um, like, stair-stepping, and it's almost yeah. like someone just scratched their nails across it or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then that's generally an indicator. Um, I mean, these, these are good. And he, he doesn't, yeah, there's a difference. But with some of his captures, he's like, I really don't see a difference, so what's the point, essentially? 
is, is one of the points you know, raised. Um, but it turns out we're running out of time. This took more time than I anticipated. So um, we'll do one more quick one and cut out the last one, which is about Dolby E, which is just a big problem, I'll tell you. You don't want to use Dolby E. Um, and play this other fun one. Let's try this. Is it just, uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. What's going on? Um, I'll stop. I'll try to stop. OK. So this file was created about 2005 some speculation, but presumably went through FireWire root. Um, it's a DV transfer, resulting in a confused QuickTime wrap DV file. Um, I ran it through a couple of the different tools out there. Uh, the DV Rescue predecessor DV analyzer, um, looking at the dimensions, again, the SAR, PAR, DAR, and while most media out metadata outputs seem fine, at least glancingly, there is um, one slight discrepancy that it seems to me at least with um, the DV rescue aspect ratio, where it spits out aspect ratio is 16.9 when most of the standard tools say 4.3. Um, and most players that I quickly had them play through exhibited that behavior, but Annie Schweikart, who is here with us today, thank you for contributing to this, was able to have it play back normally through, um, actually, why don't you, do you want to give us a little more background and information, Annie? Yeah, um, it is a DV file wrapped in QuickTime. It plays fine back in both QuickTime 10 and 7, um, but in every other player I tried, and on Windows, Mac, and Linux, it plays like that. Um, so, it, th yeah, that's mostly the context I have. I assumed it was a problem between, uh, or discrepancy between the QuickTime wrapper and the DV codec, but I could not pinpoint it myself. So if anyone knows, I would love to, <laughs> to also know. Um, maybe we can have that conversation shortly after since you hear, you're here, and Yvonne, uh, one of the discussants, can move us along to a second, very different phase of this presentation. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I guess the reason why I'm up here is because um, when I saw uh, Julia's proposal, I was immediately intrigued by this idea of like, exploring different ways of gleaning information about the provenance, the creation, or the intentions behind a moving image file just based on analyzing um, the image and the metadata. Um, and I believe this kind of understanding has potential application outside of like digitizing QC or transcoding QC or um, preservation metadata to the field that I work in, which is human rights documentation. Um, so right now, in the human rights documentation space, there is a lot of talk about authentication and verification of information, um, especially photos and videos that are being shared um, on social media, on other open sources in the intelligence or security sense of the word, so meaning like published sources, um, or of photos and videos from anonymous sources. There's also uh, an emerging, maybe overblown concern about um, deep fakes um, or synthesized media, um, although at present I would say the greater real concern is what we at Witness have called shallow fakes, which are sort of more simply um, miscontextualized, um, recycled, or lightly edited images. Um, so in the human rights world, Investigators, journalists, and legal advocates are really grappling to find ways to identify and assert the authenticity of media that they're receiving or that they're collecting. Um, often, um, you know, that show evidence of grave crimes, and that often uh, are, have um, don't have provenance, um, chain of custody, or um, contextual information attached to them. And in addition, more broadly. 
Um, there's also a great need to raise public literacy about the alteration of images um, to address this very virulent spread of harmful misinformation that we're seeing globally. So the question I wanted to ask was, what can we glean about the provenance, creation, and intentionality behind um, uh, uh, media files based on an analysis of the audiovisual attributes of the media file, like we've been doing this morning, um, and what are some accessible ways to do that analysis? Um, I'm especially keen to ask this audience here, the open source technology community, um, because in the last couple of years, there have been numerous proprietary solutions that have emerged um, claiming to solve this authentication problem with their own systems and computer vision and uh, image processing techniques. Um, the commercial solutions are not only costly, but they're also competing to dominate the market and have their IP um, form the basis of any future open standards for creating trustworthy media, um, for trustworthy media capture and verification. And TruePic and Amber are just two examples. Um, there are many um, others who are emerging in this space right now. So, are there techniques and tools that can be shared by the open source community um, that human rights advocates can use to authenticate and verify media so that people aren't reliant on costly solutions? Um, what knowledge about identifying manipulated media can the open source community share with the broader public to raise their literacy about manipulation of images? And what role can the open source community play in the development of standards around trustworthy media capture and verification? Um, and we probably don't have time to discuss any of those questions, but I would love to discuss that with any of you during any of the breaks. Um, and just before I end, I should note that there are a couple of open source projects that I know of that can help people um, create more easily verifiable uh, video documentation. Proof Mode is one that we've been involved with, with the Guardian project, and Tela is another one developed by Horizontal. Um, but both of these apps work by collecting additional device and sensor metadata um, from the point of capture on the, on the phone, as well as a hash and cryptographic signature. Um, they they don't use any sort of image data analysis or computer visioning or other techniques on the image itself to analyze its contents. Um, and I'll wrap it up. Thanks.